Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Evanston History Center's final Under the Buffalo presentation for 2022. I'm Eden Jerome Perlman, Executive Director of the History Center. Thank you all for joining us tonight. <clears throat> I see we have many members of the History Center here tonight. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. It, may, uh, it makes, sorry, admit, admitting people and speaking is sometimes hard, I apologize. Um, it makes programs like this one possible. If you are not a member, please consider joining. An annual membership to the History Center provides free admission to all our Under the Buffalo programs and more. We'll add links to our membership page in the chat. Before turning it over to speaker, I'm happy to announce we have a very exciting couple of weeks coming up. On November 1st, we're launching a new website and logo. I don't wanna to give too much away, but you'll be able to make reservations for events, read stories, view our calendar and much more. So be sure to check it out. You'll also hear about it from it with an email from us. Uh, we also have a very busy month of December beginning with the long awaited return of the holiday open house on September, excuse me, on Sunday, December 4th from one to three. A wine, spirits and more tasting on Thursday, December 8th and back by popular demand our holiday light walking tour on Thursday, December 14th. I'm tired just thinking about it. So I guess I'll hand it over to our speaker, but first I'll introduce you to him. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for this evening, Raymond Ray Wiggers. Ray is a geologist and retired professor. He has been leading popular geology tours in Chicago for the past two decades. He is here tonight to talk about his recently published book, Chicago in Stone and Clay, a guide to the Windy City's architectural geology. The book explores the interplay between the city's most architecturally significant sites, the materials they're made of, and the sediments and bedrock they are anchored in. It also explores the ornamental stone used on the Windy City's most famous landmarks, and the imposing engineering challenges of anchoring skyscrapers in the city's treacherous lake bed sediments. One writer noted of the book, this unique geologist's survey of the Windy City neighborhoods demonstrates the fascinating and often surprising links between science, art, engineering, and urban history. Ray is a native of Northeastern Illinois, a graduate of Purdue University, and also of nearby Nutrier East High School in Winnetka, but we will not hold that against him. And he has had a most interesting career. He served on active duty as an officer in the US Navy, he has worked as a geologist and field inspector for the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, chief horticulturist for a New York City landmark garden, Vermont public radio classical music host, Illinois State Museum curator, a National Park Service ranger, <clears throat> commercial greenhouse manager, and excuse me, and professor and a professor on the faculties of Barrett College of DePaul University and Lake Forest College. He's the author of numerous books, including Geology Underfoot in Illinois. We will have questions and answers after the presentation. Please feel free to type your questions into the chat function as we go, or you can wait and ask your question live by clicking the raise your hand feature and unmuting your microphone during the Q&A section, segment, excuse me. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. And now I will turn it over to you, Ray. Okay, thank you so much, Eden. And I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my show immediately here, if I can get it up.
correctly. Maybe you can confirm that it's showing. There we go. And folks, I hope uh, you came for this talk tonight because this is the one I have prepared for you. Um, can everyone see the slide first of all? We're gonna be doing some tree identification in central Italy tonight. Of course, that's not really true. Uh, <laughs> by the way, the reason I threw this slide into my PowerPoint at the last minute was I was actually transferring some slides today that I took about 50 years ago, literally, when I was living in Italy. So anyway, you got a little taste of Italy there too. Uh, the, but don't fear, tonight's talk is really on the advertised topic. And Eden, you did such a wonderful uh, intro that I don't really have a lot more to say about my own life or anything. So thank you very much for that. Thank but uh, this is the book. This is the cover of the book. This is a book that came out uh, just about two months ago, I think. It actually was scheduled for September 15th, and it came out about a month early, which was delightful. So anyway, this, this is the theme of the talk. Now, um, one of the things I'm going to show you, don't panic and run and get your phone right away if you're interested in this, but I have been given by the publisher, which is the NIU imprint, Northern Illinois University imprint of Cornell University Press, this thing called a business or a uh, author's business gift card or something like that. And when I give it to people with the scan code, they can get a 30% discount on the book. So if you don't have a copy and you find that you're interested as time goes on, at the end of the talk, I will put this on the screen again. And I have been told from the talk I did two weeks ago that it works. You can actually scan it from your screen at home. I can also send it to you by email if that doesn't work, but we'll talk about that later. Also, please, I see there's already some chat items already. Please submit questions and anything that provokes your interest is fair game. Whether I'll be able to answer every question or not, well, we'll see as we go along. Okay, so I, I've actually adapted the talk for you folks a little bit tonight. Uh, two weeks ago, as some of you know, because I know we have some repeat business, I gave a talk just on Chicago, period, for the Glessner House Museum down in the Prairie Avenue uh, district of Chicago in the South Loop, and also the Friends of the Second Presbyterian Church, two of my favorite sites in the book. And they uh, had me do a talk specifically on the city of Chicago. Now the talk tonight for you folks is for not only Chicago in a briefer way, but also we're gonna touch upon the fabled city of Evanston and also a, a couple of other, or actually several other places in the greater Chicagoland area. So uh, <laughs> this is my modification of the book cover, completely unauthorized by the publisher. And I do want to stress the book itself is just Chicago. Now, I'm hopeful that in time to come, I will be able to do a, a book on the Chicago suburbs, too. I'd like to make this a series if I could. I have a manuscript on Milwaukee that's completed already, and we'll see where that goes. Uh, but after that, probably Chicago suburbs, if I can. All right, so anyway, let's start, let's start the talk. I'm gonna be talking for about 40, 45 minutes. That's the plan. Uh, and then after that, we hopefully will have a whole bunch of questions to, to uh, discuss things with. But one of the questions I get asked all the time when I'm doing research, when I'm contacting architectural firms or when I'm even talking with other geologists, people will ask me this, how did you ever get interested in a subject as obscure and arcane as architectural geology? Did you make this thing up? Is this a, a, a sort of a pathetic attempt to be creative in your old age or what's going on here? Well, first of all, I'll tell you how I got into it, but I'll also tell you that this is a field that is very well established within the greater science of geology. It's been around at least since the late 1700s or 1800s. Uh, I've corresponded with British geologists living today who think it went back to, at least to the Italian Renaissance and maybe even to Pliny the Elder. So <laughs> it's actually a field that's very well established. And I can remember years ago when I was living in New York City, there was a very famous professor, Sidney Hornstein, who uh, actually did great Manhattan architectural geology tours. So how did I get interested? Well, after I got out of Purdue with my geology degree, um, I was given a four-year vacation by a rich uncle, Uncle Sam, who uh, made me a commissioned officer in the Navy. And I was assigned to, uh, with my geology degree, to USS Little Rock, which everyone thought was very funny. And that was the flagship of the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean. And because the Admiral was on board, we got to go to all the neat places including some really great archeological sites. 
And I'd always been interested in classical archaeology. I was one of those nerds in high school who took multiple years of Latin when it really was the Latin language and not English translations thereof. And so I was really interested in this stuff when we would go and visit these places. And I kept noticing that there was an intimate connection, especially with ancient and medieval sites, between the architecture and the stone, especially the stone the architecture was made of, and the underlying bedrock and the whole landscape that these uh, places were, were set in. And that was true in places that were considerably younger than anything built in ancient Greek or Roman times. Um, this slide here, this old slide I have of Pisa, Italy, which I took in 1977, I'll have you know, uh, <laughs> I could take the entire 45 minutes on this slide right here and tell you all the architectural geology. Uh, there are two things. First of all, there's the local stone, which is marble that was quarried in the Appuan Alps, not far from Pisa. Also, the, uh, the Leaning Tower and the Great Cathedral and the Baptistry right next door here are all set on the floodplain of the Arno River, which has alluvial sediments that are very slippery and wet and treacherous with a high water table. And that's the reason this tall, narrow, heavy thing with a shallow foundation started to lean even before they completed it. Very much like what Chicago architects have had to contend with over the years. And uh, here's, a, here's a wonderful town, uh, Entrevaux in the French uh, uh, Maritime Alps. Look at this geological setting. Imagine if in Evanston, you lived in a place like this with this giant hogback of Eocene limestone sticking up above you. Uh, <laughs> first of all, you'd wonder when the next landslide would happen. But anyway, all this in the town below, uh, that's all local stone, same as the stuff right up here. Having said all that, it's also true, and I learned this in Europe as well as when I came back to the United States, there are plenty of places, plenty of uh, examples of architecture where the materials came from far, far away. They weren't local. There wasn't a connection. Uh, this little house in Oak Park on Kenilworth Avenue in Oak Park, this actually was designed by a local architect by the name of Arnold. He clad the lower part of the house in this red sort of variegated sandstone that has been badly misidentified in one of our city's fine architectural guides. And it took me forever to find out where it came from. And I tracked it down to this little nowhere in southwestern Wisconsin, about 127 miles to the northwest. If we have any geologists out there, this is, by the way, this is the St. Peter sandstone or division, very well known from Starve Rock and places like that, but with a lot of hematite content. Uh, this little picture right down here is just a little snippet from one of my favorite places on the south side. This is the Blackstone Library, which some of you know, architects I'm sure will know it. And the interior cladding is all Carrara marble, this very choice marble from northern Italy, from Tuscany. And this marble, <laughs> when I walked in and I saw it, I walked up to the librarian on duty and I said, do you realize your entire library, you know, has about an acre's worth of Carrara marble in it on the inside? And she gave me this pitying look and she said, that can't possibly be. And I said, why? And she said, Carrara is too far away. Uh, we couldn't possibly have stone from that far away. Um, and it is 4,600 miles to the east of, of Kenwood. But believe me, for a long, long time, people have been transporting stone very great distances, including the ancient Romans, by the way. Okay, now one of the things I wanna do, most of this talk for the next 40 or 35 minutes is going to be a little tour of, little, of a few places that I mentioned in the book and also the suburbs. But I feel compelled because my mind works in a historical way to talk a little bit about Chicago's geologic origins because they really bear directly on what's going on in terms of the architecture and engineering and everything else. So I've boiled down <laughs> the entire geologic history of the Chicago region to two chapters, two brief chapters. The first one occurred a long time ago. It's called the Silurian period. And if you're wondering what all these sim symbols up at the top are here, it ran from 444 to 419 million years ago. MA is, is the convention for millions of years. And this was a time when the earth was very different than it is now. And it was the time when due to continental motion and plate motion, the continents that we think of today as being discrete continents in the right location were actually in much different places. And 
right down here, this is North America, believe it or not, most of it's underwater because this is a period of natural global warming where you have very high sea levels, no ice caps, and you have large portions of continents underwater, salt water, as well as the ocean basins. And so here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I can barely see it myself, but right down here is where we are. We're about located at this point, about 30 degrees south of the equator in the subtropical zone, which is the desert zone of the earth, bright blue skies all the time, bright sun. <laughs> and uh, it's sort of like the Persian Gulf is today or the Sinai Peninsula, uh, Sinai, uh, uh, Peninsula area of Egypt. It's a very hot, very dry place on land. And in the ocean, you have coral reefs. And we had coral reefs actually growing in Chicago and near Chicago and up in Milwaukee and all over the place in the Silurian period. By the way, a real quick shout out, because we have so many wat people watching tonight, and probably some people are from Northwestern, the person who made this map, this is part of the, what's known as the Paleo Map Project, is Christopher Scotis. And if, if this gentleman is watching by any chance, I just want to throw out a tremendous thank you on behalf of me for many years and also my students because we have used your maps. Uh, the reason I say this is he's now at Northwestern. I forgot to say that he's on the Northwestern faculty. And we have used your maps. They've been in our textbooks. Uh, I've referred people to your paleo map website. This is a really neat place to check out if you're at all interested in the way the world used to look. And you can see down on the bottom, it's called the paleo map project. And last I checked, it was still up and running. Uh, so anyway, during the Silurian period, one of the things that happened was this is when our local bedrock, our first local building material, so to speak, well, one of the first, was created during the Silurian. And in this picture up here, I am standing with some of my Morton Arboretum adult, adult ed students down here at the bottom of Thornton Quarry, which is that giant hole in the ground south of the city along Interstate uh, 294, just before you get to Indiana. And what you've got here uh, is hundreds of feet of dolostone right here. I've got something showing up on my screen. I don't know if you folks can see it. I think, I think I got rid of it. Anyway, this dolostone right here is what architects, builders, everyone else in the city calls limestone. And it's close to limestone, but if you're a geologist, you qualify it with a slightly different term. The old term for it was dolomite. The newer, more accepted term is dolostone. So if you wanna continue calling it limestone, that's perfectly fine. Feel free to do that. Uh, and in some of these places, there were coral reefs growing. And in fact, you find in the rock remnants of the coral reefs, including at Thornton, which is a great uh, ancient coral reef site. So here on this list, if you can see in the yellow, there were three places we'll be talking about for the rest of the talk where this rock, which was the number one building stone of Chicago before the fire and for a little while after the fire was quarried. The first was in the Lamont Joliet area, uh, down on the lower Des Plaines River Valley area, southwest of Chicago. The other one, or the next one was actually on the west side of Chicago within city limits. And this is the artesian quarry complex, which is completely gone now. You can't see any remnant of it. It's all, all the quarries have been filled in with garbage and everything else. And there are factories and parks on top of it now. But there were buildings you'll see tonight that were made from the artesian Silurian dolostone. And then after these two first sites uh, closed up for good, for economic reasons, in the 20th century, we started getting the same kind of stone from Lennon, Wisconsin. And if you're a gardener or if you're familiar with, uh, you know, uh, edging and, and, and I mean, Lannan stone is used for everything nowadays. But in any case, it was used tremendously in the 20th century, it's still being used to some extent in architecture today. And it looks pretty much the same as the other two. Okay, the other time frame that I want to talk about briefly is much more recent, it's the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene epoch of the Quaternary period, 2.6 million years ago to 12,000 years roughly. This is the time of our Earth's latest ice age where we have this weird oscillation of warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold. During the cold uh, glaciation, 
episodes. What you have are big continental ice sheets coming down from the north and often covering the Chicago area. And I won't get into the whole history of the Pleistocene, but during this period, the Chicago region, and this is just about everywhere we can talk about in the Chicago region, was actually graded up. It was filled in rather than eroded away or scraped away the way the Lake Michigan Basin was or, or Ontario was. The glaciers, hill, uh, glaciers here were like graders that were putting new material down in the old valleys. And the three big materials that you find all over the place in every construction site or farm field you see is glacial till down here. This has been used for Chicago common brick over the years and other types of brick. Uh, and then the stuff above it, outwash, which is more sand and gravel, has been used for roadbed, especially when it's screened for size. And then these larger rocks, the glacial erratics, um, have been used for fieldstone uh, construction. And if you're in Lake Forest and you live in a mansion, you have to have two right outside your, your driveway. Another gift of the Ice Age or another effect of the Ice Age is after, after the last Wisconsin uh, uh, stage glacier actually left the area, melted away, we had higher water levels in Lake Michigan. And this ancestral form of Lake Michigan, geologists call Lake Chicago, for good reason. And it covered most of metropolitan Chicago and parts of Evanston, in fact, going all the way up to about Highland Park or so in the Skokie River Valley and all that. These areas were actually under the, the, uh, the waves of what is now Lake Michigan. And there were also these other paraglacial lakes farther down too. And when lakes uh, are sitting on top of the land, silt and clay and other material filters down to the bottom and you get this very oozy, sloppy, sloshy, sort of jelly cake uh, consistency uh, set of layers of sediments that uh, can make building, for example, skyscrapers in downtown Chicago, a very daunting task if you're the engineer involved. Okay, so now the tour begins and what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna go around, first of all, in, in Chicago. So these are sites, these are excerpts of sites in my book. And I thought I would start tonight with the one quintessential slide that really sums up of all the slides I have. I have thousands of slides on Chicago buildings and all that. I thought I'd choose the one that was most quintessentially Chicago. Uh, it's really Windy City in a single in a single slide. And here it is. And I'm sure you recognize the Chicago neighborhood. You've got uh, 1,500 foot limestone cliffs, Cretaceous limestone with a river flowing down the middle. Uh, obviously, that's not Chicago at all. And in case you're wondering, this is another place I like to hang out when I can, which is Big Bend National Park in Trans-Pecos, Texas. In fact, this part over here is Big Bend in the United States. That is the Rio Grande, and that over there is Mexico. And uh, it's one of the most spectacular geologic places in the world, almost as spectacular as Chicago. And uh, let me go to Chicago now that I mention it. And so here now I am standing on East Randolph looking at Peru 1 and Peru 2. I can remember as a kid in the late 50s, my dad taking me over to show me the Prudential building, which was newly completed. And he would point to it proudly and say, this is the highest building anyone's ever built in Chicago. So that's how ancient I am. But the reason I wanted to show you first Big Bend and then Chicago was to do this. I'm going to torment you for a minute. And I'm going to have you do this exercise with me. Suppose for a minute, you're one of my college students from years past. This is final exam day. And you've got one 100 point question for your final exam. Your final grade rests on how you do on this. Here's my question to you. Tell me how, not how these are different, but how these are alike why it is just as valid for a geologist to hang out in a place like this than it is here, okay? And you can probably think immediately of certain things. One of the points I make in the introduction of my book is both of these places are nature. You may not think of a urban location or a place that's human made as being nature, but it is. It's impossible to get out of nature, whether you like it or not. And so you can see that there are vertical faces, there are stone being exposed to the elements, you know, to the atmosphere, to uh, water and everything else. 
there are all sorts of correspondences that you can draw between these two environments, and an architectural geologist can do that. So there's a lot of kinship, whether people realize it or not, between this place, geologically speaking, and also, you know, what we call out in the wild. Okay, with that in mind, let's do a quick whirlwind tour of Chicago, and then we'll get to that really important place, Evanston, and also other places too. Um, I always like to start, when I do this talk, I always like to start here, because this is where I usually start my downtown geology tours. Uh, this is a place I remember from my youth as the main branch of the Chicago Public Library, <laughs> and now it's the Chicago Cultural Center. And it's been a treat. I've done talks in this place. I've done tours. I've done tours that have been almost all about this building and nothing else because there's so much in here. And the three pictures I've got on this slide only give you a small percentage of the inventory of building stone and geologically derived metals and everything else that you have in this building. Um, for those of you who are architects or restorationists, you probably are looking right now if I can find my, there I go. Okay. You're probably looking at my identification of the stone for this building and you're saying, uh-oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Because you probably know the stone that makes up most of the exterior of the building as something called Bedford stone or Bedford limestone or Indiana limestone. You're absolutely correct. Those are the trade names for that stone. But being a geologist, I use the scientifically correct name, just the way a botanist would refer to a, uh, you know, a sugar maple by its taxonomic name. I'm going to do the same thing with the with the rock types. The good thing in the book is that I use all of those names. Uh, I will often say if it's Salem limestone, I'll say it's also known as Bedford or Indiana to you architect types. Okay, so this is Salem or Bedford, and it is the one most prevalent building stone in America and has been probably for 100 years. Uh, I could go on and on about the environment in which it formed. I'll tell you, it's about 360 million years old. It comes from the Mississippian subperiod. That may not mean anything to you, so I won't drone on about that. But it's a very dependable sort of buff colored to bluish gray stone that has been used all over the place. And if you're an author writing about the geology of buildings in Chicago, one of your biggest challenges <laughs> is talking about it over and over again because it's so prevalent. However, it's such a neat rock, you can do that if you know what you're doing. Um, below it, there is a very rare granite called Stone Mountain Granite from Georgia, from Stone Mountain, a very famous geologic site in Georgia. Um, and then inside, oh my Lord, there's so much stuff to talk about. There's Carrara marble, there's green Connemara marble from Ireland. The Favreau glass by Tiffany, that is actually a geologically derived material. I talk about it in the book. And then if you go upstairs, there's still more stuff. You know, they don't build libraries like this anymore. Even in places like Barrington or Lake Forest, they don't build libraries like this anymore. And so what you've got up in the second floor is the Grand Army of the Republic Hall that is clad in what architects will call green marble or something like that. And actually what it is, it's an extremely exotic rock called serpentinite. And serpentinite, this serpentinite uh, was quarried in Vermont. And it started not as Earth's crust like every other good rock does that's used architecturally. It comes from the Earth's upper mantle, which is much deeper down. And it was originally a very unusual igneous rock, ultramafic rock called dunite or peridotite. And it was scraped up by an approaching landmass, an island arc, a volcanic island arc, and glommed onto the side of North, ancestral North America. Um, and in the process, it was metamorphosed into this beautiful green and white veined form. Uh, so that's some of the wonderful things you'll see just in that one building. Caddy corner to it, the Pittsfield building on Wabash, facing on Wabash. Uh, once again, I could go prattling on with this for 40 minutes and I won't. I will point out one stone here, which is this one right here. And you find this in the door panels outside on both uh, Washington and on Wabash. This is a very famous Italian stone that's been used since ancient Roman times. It's called the Rosso Ammonitico Veronese limestone comes from Verona, northern Italy, 
and it's Jurassic in age, and it actually has dinosaur age marine fossils. And I hope you can see that thing. It may look like a snail shell to you. It's much larger than a snail. This is an ammonoid, uh, one of the coiled shelled cephalopods related to modern squid and octopi that were populating the Tethys Ocean back in the age of the dinosaurs. So you get fossils like that on the side of the building. You get marble that's every bit as beautiful as Carrara from uh, Alabama. You have metamorphic rock and other stuff from Greece. And you have uh, this black rock on the exterior here is from northern Wisconsin from the mid-continent rift from a period when the North America tried to tear itself apart. So you have so much in just that small area. Um, before we leave the loop, one, one place I've got to talk about because everyone asks about it is this building right here. And I've seen in the architectural press a lot of unkind words about this building. It's been an unlucky building. I actually like it. And this started as the Standard Oil Building, then it was the Amoco Building, and then it was Aon Center. And as a lot of you probably know, originally it was clad in Carrara marble. Not only was it clad in Carrara marble, which is a great stone to use indoors, but in Chicago, don't use it outdoors. The problem, one of the problems with the stone, and it had several in that application, was that the people, the great quarriers in Carrara, the great marble quarrying families that go back to the Middle Ages in, in Italy, they had actually they had actually discovered a way to slice it even more thinly than they had before. So the cladding panels were only an inch to an inch and a half thick. And they warped very quickly after installation on this 80 plus story monster. And it was replaced ultimately, as a lot of you know, by this uh, domestic granite from North Carolina, the Mount uh, Airy granite or granodiorite to be really accurate. So that, of course, that story is prominently uh, in my book under the loop. Uh, what else do we have in the loop? Well, first of all, we have some of the great Art Deco, Art Modern skyscrapers from various great architectural firms that many of you probably know already. I have a term that I use in my book called the Grand Art Deco Formula. This is just my own little, little nickname or whatever for this. And I realize this isn't the greatest picture, but this is the only one I could dredge up from one of my favorite buildings. This is 333 North Michigan. And it is a classic Art Deco, Art Modern building. It's got the setbacks. It's basically a setback of what you might call Bedford or Indiana limestone. It's a setback mountain of Indiana limestone. I call it Salem. Um, but at the bottom, you get an insurrectionary stone cladding at the very base in the ground level or the first two floors or whatever. In the case of 333, it's the stone called the Morton Nice which is uh, geologically endlessly fascinating. This is the most ancient stone that you'll find in North American architecture. It dates to about 3.52 billion years. It is three quarters the age of our solar system. When this rock was first created, and it's gone through various phases of changes and metamorphosis, but when it was first created, the earth was a very different place. And I actually, discuss that a little bit in the book. But it is a very highly contorted, highly patterned, very chaotic looking stone. And so that sort of undoes, or at least it contrasts with the very bland uh, Salem limestone above it. Uh, architects of that era also love to use very fancy, rather chaotic looking stone in lobbies. For example, the Larissa Ophicel site here in 333. This stone was actually first used by Byzantine architects for places like the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople or in Istanbul. Farther down on Michigan, we have the Portland sandstone. Uh, a lot of the, the, the brownstone buildings that you'll see in Chicago are covered with uh, Lake Superior brownstone from either Northern Wisconsin or from Northern Michigan. This building was built after all those quarries in Lake Superior had closed down for building stone and so the architect here in the 1920s had to resort to the stuff that everyone uses out on the East Coast, which is the Connecticut River Valley, Connecticut slant Massachusetts stone that you see like on the Upper West Side of Manhattan and in Park Slope, Brooklyn. So this is the Portland sandstone. And if you look at this picture down in the lower left, you'll see that this is actually 
one of the Ashler blocks here actually preserves cross bedding, which is to geologists, a very interesting sedimentary feature. This was created, these were ripples that were created in the sand before it turned to stone by some shallow lake edge, the water in the shallow lake edge, or maybe by a flowing stream at a time when North America was breaking up Pangaea, the supercontinent, was breaking away from Africa. A little farther down, still on Michigan Avenue, we have the auditorium building. Um, I could once again spend way too much time about the auditorium building. The stone here is really interesting. You have some really interesting granite from Minnesota and also from Maine, as well as the Salem above it. But the interesting, the most interesting story here is the foundation geology or the substrate geology and how Dankmar Adler and also his, uh, his uh, assistant or his helper, William Soy Smith, one of the great foundation engineers of American history, how they fought using the old technology, the old uh, shallow foundation technology to keep this building stable and how they were undermined when the building committee decided almost at the last minute that they were going to change after all the calculations and all the trial measurements and everything were done. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the committee decided that they were going to have stone on the outside of the building instead of lighter brick. And of course, that threw off all the calculations. But anyway, that's part of the story. I also talk about the later foundations for later buildings that use caissons and pilings especially the caisson story, which, which features William Soy Smith very prominently. Uh, another thing too, before we leave the loop, I have to talk about metal buildings because iron, the main component of steel is geologically derived too. And you have two different approaches to this metal uh, and to weathering and to geologic processes of weathering. You have stainless steel on the inland uh, steel building across from what I still call the First National Bank building. And then of course you have the Daily Center where you have the core 10 weathering steel where rust is preferred at least to start with. And I talk about that in the book a lot. But once you get out of the loop, there's so much more. If you go down to the South side as I did and really explored the architectural geology, oh my goodness. There's so much you know, to write about. You can do an entire book just on the south side and the different neighborhoods. This is in Bronzeville. This is 3300 uh, 3, South Calumet. Look at these three Richardsonian Romanesque houses that are lined up like a display in a stone dealer's place right here. You've got on the left, you've got Salem limestone, looks good. You've got a much rarer rock in the middle called the Napoleon sandstone from Southern Michigan, which has kind of a greenish yellow color. It's very strange looking rock. And then you have what I think is Lake Superior uh, brownstone from one place or another, though I can't get provenance on that right hand building. How about that? And you see all sorts of things like that on the south side. Uh, you go to the far south side, you go to the famous Pullman neighborhood and you have, not only do you have the wonderful Greenstone Church, which I talked about a couple of weeks ago, but you have, a wonderful example of brick geology. And you have two types of brick that were used in Pullman for the workers' uh, houses or homes in, oops, I'm sorry, in Pullman. You have the red facing brick, which is every bit as high quality as Philadelphia facing brick or St. Louis facing brick. It was manufactured from Ice Age lacustrine sediments uh, in Porter, Indiana, not too far away in Indiana Dunes country. And then for the humbler uh, homes, and also for the backs and the sides of the nicer homes, you have Lake Calumet brick. This is the common brick, very dark colored, uh, dark burning brick uh, that came from the clay deposits at the, at the bottom of Lake Calumet, much closer at hand. On the west side, you've got more of the Grand Art Deco formula. There's the great throne-like Daily News building. I still call it Daily News building instead of two Riverside. And you've got the Salem limestone, huge acre, many acres of Salem limestone. And then you've got the insurrectionary uh, Morton nice down at the bottom with these big amphibolite clasps swimming in, in, in granite and nice and everything else. Um, I also really like Union Station. Uh, for one thing, 
uh, and you restorers know this, uh, architects and restorers know that what I'm talking about is original stone. Sometimes there's been other stuff that's been added or replaced, and I'm primarily talking about the originals tonight. But here you have a restored staircase that went, they went back and got the original stone. This is Tivoli Travertine, known to architects usually as just Travertine or Roman Travertine. This was the famous uh, facing stone of Imperial Roman architects. It has that pitted texture. It was actually a limestone that formed in hot springs. Also on the flooring of the, 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 of the waiting area, there you have one of the classic American interior ornamental stones, which is known as Tennessee mar marble. It's actually not a marble, it's a limestone. It's the Holston limestone from Eastern Tennessee. At least they got the state right, but I could go on and on about that. Also on the west side, we have the uh, wonderful old St. Pat's Church. This is the oldest surviving house of worship in Chicago. It almost got burned in the fire, but there was a fire the night before that cleaned out the area to the south of it, so it was saved from the big fire. And ironically, this old, old church is made of Milwaukee brick. This is the classic Cream City brick. There is Lamont Joliet Solarian Dolestone down at the bottom and for trim, but most of it is Cream City Brick from Wisconsin, which I write a lot about in my Milwaukee book. Another geological material that I talk about at some length is terracotta, which is clay-based, usually if it's fired clay, just like brick, often glazed, not always glazed, but often. And this is one of my favorite terracotta sites in the city. Uh, this is <laughs> high Spanish Baroque design, ironically designed by uh, two Norwegian American architects, local architects. So I call this Hispano Nordic architecture. And you also get, whoops, bear with me. My mouse is going crazy. I don't know what's happening. Hold on one second. Something like this always has to happen. I'm having trouble advancing. Well, I may just not be able to go back there. I don't know. Huh. There we go. I'm getting there. Oh, it's on automatic or something. How do I stop that? I think it's stopping. I won't use my mouse at all. Anyway, you can also see it lower right there. You can see Flemish bond brick where you have uh, alternating headers and stretchers, a very nice decorative pattern that uh, brick masons use. On the north side, of course, you have the water tower. This is our classic example of Lamont Joliet Dolestone and, and also the pumping station. I realize some of it's been replaced, but some of it's still there. Uh, I have the carving up there on the upper right to show you that one of the problems with the stone is at least sometimes it tends to spall and to deteriorate a little too much. You see that at the Union Stockyards gate a lot. Other stone that's been used on the upper, upper or on the north side uh, in River North, you have the great cable house with Oneota Dola stone or uh, Casota stone from Southern Minnesota, beautiful carving stone. And then there are the great cemeteries. And by the way, in my book, I feature two cemeteries, both on the north side. Since the book came out or, or since the book went into production, I've also been exploring south side cemeteries as well and they have wonderful geology in them so this is graceland and i think a lot of you are familiar with graceland cemetery i won't talk to you about all these different stone types but uh just look at all the different geology if you're a geologist watching this and you're not already aware cemeteries are a wonderful place to teach geology as some geology professors out east certainly know Another place for great geology is the Elks National Memorial in Lincoln Park neighborhood. And they even, they even have fancy Italian stone, architects would call it marble, it's actually limestone for the covers of the, uh, you know, for the, uh, the heating covers right there. Uh, and here you've got Skyros Brescia, which is from, from Greece, from the Aegean. You have all sorts of different stones, true marbles, and also other things called marble, uh, beautiful polishable stones. The exterior, once again, is Salem limestone. What a place to visit. 
And then we have Rose Hill, very close to Evanston. So we're getting close to Evanston now. And look at all the different rock types. And you can see that uh, our friend Boynton, the, the famous early Amer uh, Chicago architect who did the water tower and pumping station, he's still crenulating things here. This is the entrance to Rose Hill. He's using Lamont Joliet Dolostone, but there's Carrara marble, early use of Carrara in Chicago and granites from New England and all sorts of stuff. It's just wonderful. Okay, so that's Chicago. Now what I wanna do is get suburban on you for the last few minutes of the talk. And we're not gonna be quite as detailed, but we are gonna to touch upon some interesting things. And I'm not stop, actually I'm not starting in Evanston. I'm starting down in the quarrying district in Lamont and Joliet. So this is a topo map over on the left. This is the Palos Heights region in here, if you know where the Palos suburbs are, and then Chicago would be up to the upper right up there or downtown Chicago. And this is the displays, the lower displays coming down. There's Joliet, a lot of you I'm sure are aware of where that is by the interstate. And there's Lamont, the town of Lamont. And what you've got are these two different zones where the Silurian Dolostone was quarried in great, great abundance and then shipped up the INM Canal, the Illinois and Michigan Canal to Chicago. And this is what the sides of the canal look like. One of the reasons people realized there was this building stone was the INM construction project. And it's the thin bedded type of stone called sugar run formation. Uh, if you haven't, you should pay a visit to Lamont and Joliet and look at the wonderful old buildings. Even the most uh, pedestrian or most utilitarian of the buildings really are beautiful, especially is there stone weathers. And this is true of the water tower in Chicago too. It weathers this wonderful warm buttery yellow or even sometimes ochre color as it continues to weather. So the top two uh, are Lamont, the bottom two obviously are Joliet. Okay, so I just wanted to do that because that's our great geologic uh, center point for the Chicago area is the Lamont Joliet area. Evanston though is a very interesting place geologically. And I just chose at random a building in Evanston to demonstrate how wonderful the geology is on the buildings of Evanston. I don't know if any of you recognize this building. If you don't, you'll get the joke in a minute. This building has three different layers of geology. There's the red uh, sandstone right here, okay, and also on the side and down below. There is this wonderful, very enigmatic brick, this yellow brick, and then there is this wonderful terracotta glazed tile up above for the roofing. All of these are geologically derived materials and you can talk to a great degree about the origins of all of them. And we don't actually know the source of the brick, but we know the stone and we know the tile. So here is, here we are at the Dawes house. And what we've got is this, this is the Western side of the house. Here's the stone, and it is actually one of the varieties of Lake Superior brownstone. And you say, well, it's not brown, it's bright red. Well, this was the exception for the brownstones. You'll see a good example of real brownstone in a minute. But this was the Portage red variety, which was wildly popular back in the late 1800s, 1890s especially. Uh, and this had this cheerful red color to it. It was quarried up in the Keweenaw Peninsula and geologists call the sandstone of this age up there, it's called the Jacobsville sandstone. Above it is the brick. Now, if you saw a close up of the brick, you'd see that not only is it orange, but it has these little dots of sort of reddish brown dots of congealed iron from the iron mineral content that the clay originally had when it was fired. And I don't actually know, no one seems to know where the brick came from. Very often brick is hard to source for one reason or another. But if I show you the next picture, I will show you two buildings, one in Chicago, that's the Rubby House down in Hyde Park, Frank Lloyd Wright, very famous. And this is the not quite as famous uh, Oneida Street uh, power station up in Milwaukee. Both of these buildings are made of iron spot brick from St. Louis, which was a big, regional brick producer, very famous, very high quality brick. 
And their clay came from ancient paleosols, from ancient soils, from Pennsylvanian swamp forests, about 300 million years old. And uh, I think this is probably St. Louis, but I just can't prove it. There's actually another building in Milwaukee called the Paps Theater, which has brick that this, it's a lighter color like this and it's iron spotted and it's from St. Louis too. So it's a good bet that it probably is. Now, <laughs> let's look at the rest of Evanston briefly anyway. This is, of course, Emmanuel Methodist. And I don't know if we have any congregation members here or not, but this is real classic Lake Superior brownstone. And this is what Richard Sonning and Romanesque uh, architects often like. They like the somber, dark look. So do I. Uh, and the geology in this one building, oh, it's amazing. So on the side of the building, there's this pattern. I hope you can see this one ashlar block right here. It has a sedimentary feature. This isn't ripple marks. This is called cross bedding. And this indicates that this rock, the sediment, the, the sand that makes up this rock was originally laid down by a flowing stream, probably. And it, you actually know the direction the water was flowing in from the pattern here. And you see that in various places with Lake Superior brownstone. Uh, and this particular stone didn't come from Porta Gentry up in the Keweenaw. It came from northern Wisconsin from the Apostle Islands, from Stockton Island. Also, talking about other houses of worship in Evanston, we have uh, our good regional Silurian Dolestone, well represented. Uh, we have St. Mary's and we have First Presbyterian. They're both clad in, guess what, Lamont Joliet Dolestone from the Silurian. But we also have in the Beth Emmett uh, Synagogue, we have a wonderful example of 20th century sort of retake on Silurian Dolostone after it had come, it had gone out of fashion and then it came back into fashion with 20th century architects. But these quarries were no longer in existence for building stone. And so architects turned to Lannan Stone from Wisconsin, from up just Northwest of Milwaukee. Then we have to talk about the Northwestern University campus. And I realize that probably someone here in our audience has done some restoration work on some of these buildings. I've, I've seen a lot in the literature about restoration projects for these buildings, or at least some of them. And I realize that some of the stone I talk about may not be there as much as before, but just look at all the different things you have. Uh, you have terracotta, you have Roman brick, the long, narrow brick style. Uh, you have the original Lamont Joliet in the University Hall. You have Salem at Swift Hall. I spent a lot of time in a Navy training program when I was in high school in that wing right there before it was modified. And Deering Library turns out to be the real plum of the whole campus, geologically speaking, because it has so many neat things. Now, if you've done a restoration on this work, feel free to, or work on this area right in here, feel free to correct me, but it's my understanding that the pavers here are still the Aquia Creek sandstone or George Washington sandstone that was used for a while in Washington, DC, but it's very, very rare now in uh, the Chicago area. Downtown Evanston, especially the older buildings, uh, I, call, I call Evanston Salemopolis because there's so much Salem or so much Bedford. I have a real fondness for this building. This is where my mom worked for a number of years as an editor. Yeah, and this is where hobby models used to be. And this is where the bargain basement books were and Chandler's and all that. I remember all that stuff because I grew up in Wilmette. Speaking of Wilmette, <laughs> as we move out of Evanston, we got to talk about the Baha'i House of Worship. And from a distance, it looks like Salem limestone. It looks so much. The color is just almost perfect for it. But it turns out to be beautifully molded white pebble, quartz pebble concrete. And yes, indeed, concrete is a very geologic material. I talk about it a lot in my Chicago book. I talk a lot about it in the Milwaukee manuscript too. Elsewhere, this is my old church, my family church. This is First Presbyterian, Lannan Stone in Wilmette. And then in the Women's Club, this is a building that's gone on, undergone a lot of change or reconstruction recently. Um, but uh, it has surviving panels of this fossil rich stone. These are actually boring tubes for some marine organism that was living about 540 million years ago at the bottom of the ocean. Whoops, there we go again. So anyway, all sorts of cool stuff in Wilmette too. Uh, 
Finally, jumping up to Lake County, what we've got is brick at Fort Sheridan that looks like Milwaukee Cream City brick. Actually, it's very difficult to tell brick apart when you're right along the Lake Michigan shoreline from about Lake Forest or Lake Bluff or Fort Sheridan all the way up past Milwaukee because the glacial sediments or the fluvatile sediments that were used for the brick locally were very rich in magnesium and calcium and they burn this cream color instead of red or even salmon. So this is locally produced brick. It was produced on site right on the Lake Michigan Bluff in Fort Sheridan for the Army base at the time. Uh, also, and then up in Lake Forest, we have all sorts of wonderful stuff. Here is an example of artesian dolostone. This was quarried on the west side of Chicago. This is the first Presbyterian church. This rock was actually re, uh, recycled from the er earlier version of the second Presbyterian in Chicago and brought up here. And it has what you find often in reefal stone. This is bitumen. This is uh, the, the uh, petroleum-based organic residue of marine organisms from an earlier, or excuse me, from a later geologic period in the Silurian that seeped down into this rock. And in the 19th century, this spotting effect was considered ornamentally very, very, very pleasing and was much sought after. Uh, also, we have more Lake Superior sandstone. Look what a beautiful carving stone it is. This is on my old campus, Lake Forest College. This is Durand Earth Center. Look at this thing. It's just gorgeous. Up in Waukegan, we have more brownstone, but this time, whoops, this time it's from actually Carbondale, Illinois, down in Southern Illinois, where they have red Pennsylvanian sandstones. And here in Oakwood Cemetery along the lake in Waukegan, you have a species I really love of tree. This is the Bedford tree or the Salem limestone trees. These were used for monuments in late 19th century and early 20th century America. And they were custom carved by artisans down in Southern Indiana and shipped up to wherever they were going. That actually told something about the individual who is in the burial plot. And you can see, for example, up in Kenosha, you can see sea captains that have trees festooned with anchors and, and nautical line and everything else, all sorts of different themes. But this is a pretty classic theme in, in graveyards. And this is Salem limestone, which, by the way, doesn't hold up all that well. Uh, Oak Park, got to talk about briefly, concrete again, Frank Lloyd Wright, the Unity Temple. And also a church I just love. This is the Pilgrim Congregational Church along Lake Street also. And it is a classic example of reefal artesian rock with that wonderful bitumen or asphaltum spotting all over. It looks like a Dalmatian rock. And elsewhere in the city, you find larvikite, this wonderful glittering rock with big feldspar crystals that glitter in the sunlight and all sorts of neat things. Over in the Fox River Valley, you've got one of my favorite fieldstone buildings. This is the first, or excuse me, the United Methodist Church of Batavia. And the people there, the nice people there actually helped me really research this building. Look at that goofy entrance arch. Isn't that wonderful? And that is huge blocks of Salem limestone, Bedford limestone, rock-faced and fit to make this really big arch right there. And the rest of these boulders came from local farm fields not far from Batavia. Glacial erratics. My final building, my final site for you tonight is the goofiest of them all. I love this building dearly. The Elks organization is getting a lot of uh, advertising from me tonight because we did the Elks National Memorial on the north side of Chicago. This is Elks Lodge number 705 in on Stolp Island in the middle of the Fox River in Aurora. Aurora is a great geological town. And here they decided to do an Elks Lodge that was supposed to be a simulation of ancient Mayan Central American architecture. This was their take on that back in the 30s. And they used clinker br bricks, which are bricks that are fired too hot. They actually vitrify and melt and bend and they stick out at weird angles. So this sort of looks like a Salvador Dali building right here, but I just love that clinker brick. Isn't that weird? So in Aurora, that's where I'm gonna stop my whirlwind tour. 
uh, once again, the book itself is covering just Chicago. So you guys got a little bit of a bonus for other communities in Evanston and other communities besides Chicago. So with that, I will finally stop yammering and I will thank you for your kind attention. And hopefully we've got some questions, I hope. And also, while we're getting ready, Eden, one thing I'll put up on the screen, that is the scan code or the QR code that you can use to get the 30% discount on the book, Chicago uh, in Stone and Clay. And if for any reason you want that, but you can't scan it successfully, you can send me, uh, your, or you can, you can email me at the email address down there and I can send you a copy of it. Okay, Eden, I'll turn it over to you, I think. Okay, terrific. You wanna, if you, if you wanna, uh, we'll leave that up a moment and then we'll stop sharing so that we can see okay. our, um, so I have a, I'm wondering, this is my personal question <laughs> and then I'll, and then I'll let other people. Um, it is, tell me a little bit about cleaning some of these buildings. And I, the reason I ask is, um, you showed the the fabulous example of the Methodist Church in Evanston, and you um, specifically pointed out the dark, um, the coloration. Yeah. And I've seen other examples where buildings are cleaned, and I'm a little wondering. I, I'm wondering a little what what protocol. I, you know, I, I maybe this is a question, like a preservation question. I don't yeah. know, but. But yeah. I don't know how easy it is to clean. I'm actually thinking of the Driehaus Museum. The other building is that it was all black and is now all white. So I'm just right, right. curious your thoughts on this. Well, are you talking about the Nickerson House, the Driehaus? Yeah, House? exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, yeah, I did the Cable House, which is their headquarters of the Driehaus Company or whatever. Yeah, which yeah. is across the street from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the Drehaus Museum is actually Berea sandstone from Ohio, and it's this fine grained sandstone that is a wonderful building stone. Um, it gets dirty, especially when the city is building or burning bituminous coal from the Illinois basin the way it did for many decades. I have a wonderful quotation from H.G. Wells who visited Chicago like in 1890 something, and he says, it's just everything is black, you know. And that was very difficult in those days. My understanding about the Nickerson house or dry house was they used a laser technique. They used a rather high tech laser um, technology to clean it off. I could be wrong, but I'm not a preservationist. So I, there are probably people in the audience that could answer the question better than I can. Some other stone is very difficult. One thing I will say real quickly is that's one of the big selling points in, in bituminous coal Chicago for terracotta. And in the book, I've got this wonderful picture of the Railway Exchange Building, you know, which is where the Chicago Architecture Foundation or Center used mm -hmm. to be. That was white terracotta. And there's a picture in Brick Builder magazine where it's black or almost black from the soot. And they show a cleaning stage washing it off. So like half the building is white and half is, is black. Terracotta could be cleaned very nicely. Uh, but then along came not only different fuel sources, but the Clean Air Act provisions in the later 20th century, which made things a little less or a lot less dirty in terms of building surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's interesting. It's it, like I said, it's probably a little like the preservation argument. Sometimes you go back to the original, do you? Um, yeah. 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 Well, um, my, okay. One Wait, thing I'll you say mind? is often, often Cream City brick, I think, in you know, like Milwaukee or whatever, it looks better dirty. <laughs> That's a different story. <laughs> Uh, Ray, would you mind stop sharing so that we can see? Because I'm not sure if people have, so, uh, people have hands up and that kind of thing. Okay, so what do I do? Do I just turn? You off? just hit at the bottom. It should say it's a green thing, and it should say stop share. Yeah, I think I hit it, but I don't know if it's doing it or not. No, we've still got you. I can do stop video. Should I do that? No, then you're going to go away. Uh, they got to hit the green one that says, it says green share one. screen, so it. You need to stop share. We don't want you to go away. I got it. I got it. There, I got it. there we go. Yay! Now we've got you, which is, uh, and and all my and and. So I'm going to ask a question. I do see Nancy has her hand raised. So I'm going to ask my the question, and then I'm going to um. Then I'm going to come back to Nancy. So uh, this was in the chat actually. Um, so 
our, our guest says, my father's family is from Bedford, Indiana. Yeah. And her great grandfathers were stone carvers from Bedford. Um, and she's wondering if you ever visited the Gilgal Cemetery. And she says there are extraordinary trees there. Are there really? No, I haven't. And I, you know, trees, I'm, I'm really interested in that. <laughs> um, there are so many trees that are, that are located in, uh, especially in Forest Home uh, in Milwaukee and Kenosha and places like that. But I haven't been to that one. I'd love to go. Yeah. And apparently there's another cemetery. I'm just looking at the chat called Green Hill Cemetery in Bedford. That has. I would. Now, I've done geologic tours. I've led geologic tours to Bedford and that area, and we've gone to the quarries, but I never have gone to the cemeteries there. So maybe on your next trip. I'm going. <laughs> um, Nancy, if you want to unmute and turn on your camera, we'd love to hear your question. There you are. Okay. Hi. Hi. That was so interesting. I can't even tell you how much I loved it. And mm -hmm. I have. I'm sorry to say reserved your book at the library, but I'm going oh. to buy a copy for my brother who's a geologist. Um, could you comment a little more on the underlying geology of downtown Chicago and what it takes to build yep. these huge tall yep. buildings, please? Yep. So what, what basically, in fact, in the New York Times in the late 1800s, uh, the substrate of Chicago was described as a jelly roll cake. Uh, and if you can imagine trying to build a uh, skyscraper in jelly roll where you have these very, very squishy layers of different things, that's mm -hmm. basically what the substrate is. The bedrock is somewhere between 50 or 60 feet down under layer after layer of first glacial sediments and then lake bed sediments, sometimes also river sediments, depending on where you are in the loop. And all of these are, or not all of them, but some of them are lubricated by groundwater. That's quite a water table. It's quite high, or at least it was traditionally. And so it is extremely difficult to put large buildings in. And I'll stop there, but there's a whole story about that. But most of those sediments are Pleistocene to recent or Holocene in age. They're young sediments sitting on 425 million year old bedrock. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'm gonna review a question that was in the chat, but that one of uh, my amazing colleagues answered for you. But so I'll see if you know the answer and then I, it's, it's been in the chat, but I'm not sure if our, our uh, the person who asked it saw the answer. So the, the question is, do you know the Milton H. Wilson mansion at Forest and Greenleaf in Evanston, 1100 Forest Avenue? What material is that made of? But if you don't know the building, obviously. I'm going to go with your know. amazing colleague's answer, whatever uh, he or she said. <laughs> <laughs> My amazing colleague, Chris, says. Oh, Chris. Well, okay. Then, yeah, Chris knows. Chris will know. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> she the said. Thing, the, thing, the thing is, um, you know, it's a building I've, uh, or a house I've, I've driven by a million times, but I'd have to look at it again to, to comment. But it looks well, like a good answer already. Chris says uh, Bedford Limestone, and Chris leads our walking tours, and I bet she didn't know she was giving also a geological tour while she was, while she was busy giving her tours. Um, can you tell us a little about um, climate change, kind of the climate crisis, and, and um, how that affects stone quarries? Or maybe affects buildings? How it affects, I'm sorry, stone what? I'm sorry. The quarries how it affects stone quarries. Um, or well, quarry extinction, or maybe just more about the impact of quarry extinction and that and sort of. Well, I felt obligated for a while. In fact, for a number of years when I was you know, teaching college, I, ha I taught a climate change uh, science uh, unit for my earth science students. And I actually did talks on climate change at, uh, at you know, libraries or whatever. And uh, it's a very serious problem. On the impact it will have on quarries, well, it's going to be the larger economic challenges that, and, and civilizational challenges that impose themselves in general that will also affect quarries. Uh, there could be times when increased precipitation in certain areas of North America, for example, might cause more quarry flooding or something like that. But I don't know, for a day-to-day -day operation of a quarry, how specifically climate change will 
affect that. Certainly in coastal areas, I know how it will affect it because we're going to lose a lot of coastal areas in the next 200 years, probably. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So it's a shame we have to have the, well, I guess climate change has always been going on. We saw in the early part of your talk, the question is how, how quickly it's going on, maybe, maybe yeah. now we're the concern. That's very, That's very true. So how would you compare um, modern building, you know, what's your sort of assessment of more modern building materials and how do they, and how they compare to more historic materials? In terms of quality or appearance or what? I guess in terms of quality and, and maybe even um, longevity, because I know, you know, um, you know, you hear it all the time. They don't build them like they used to. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly in terms of, you know, when I showed the Chicago Cultural Center, I mean, that was a public structure for, you know, everyone to use. And it was outfitted in Carrara marble and Connemara marble and, you know, serpentinite and everything else. So in terms of the interiors, I don't see that kind of quality or that kind of detail in modern uh, buildings usually, but maybe someone here could give me an example of that. In terms of exterior materials, we've benefited from another 100 or 150 years of material science, where we've seen which materials work better. And there's been a lot more scientific analysis of materials before they're applied. So I'd say generally today, they're probably superior. Mm -hmm. Now we could get into a whole separate discussion about especially uh, rebar concrete versus ancient Roman concrete, <laughs> which lasts a lot longer, but I'm not going to go there. So I think in general, we have some really good materials now. And some of the stone, especially the postmodern, starting with the postmodernists, they brought in stuff from everywhere. Uh, geologists should pay money to postmodernist architects for, for <laughs> we have granite from Sardinia, uh, you know, on some of the buildings in downtown Chicago, not to mention everywhere else in the world, China, Iran, and everywhere else. Very interesting. A quick question. Somebody's asking, um, does your book cover issues of, does your book cover issues of building skyscrapers, excuse me, skyscrapers on clay? Yes, very much so. Uh, I really get into the foundation uh, geology and foundation engineering, and we talk about the different. I talk about one of the great foundation disasters of Chicago, which was one of the earlier federal buildings that was put on a continuous concrete raft and how it began to break apart and everything. We talk about caissons and pilings and modern techniques. So the short answer, which wasn't short, is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, a comment in the chat uh, from um, Jack Weiss, who is a designer, knows a lot about buildings. Yeah. Um, he said he commented, "Glass is the newest geological form." So I kind of like that. I'm I like not. That. It's all geological. You know the. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had, a, I had a big problem when I was doing this book was what I delimit as geological and not geological. I could have talked about window glass. That's very geological. Mm -hmm. but if I did that, the book would be 10,000 pages long. Yeah, well, <laughs> you had to cut it off somewhere. Speaking of cutting it off, it's, it's nearly, it's about 8.15, but I'm going to ask you one last question, which is my sort of standard um, last question, unless okay. somebody's dying to ask something. Um, which is, so what's next? What's, we talked a little bit about a possible suburban project. Yeah. Um, would that be something similar to this or? or uh, what's, what's, well, what's I next? have a manuscript that I've completed, uh, which is a companion to the Chicago book on Milwaukee, which mm -hmm. is another town I dearly love. And uh, it's got wonderful geology, not of all, all of which is found in Chicago and vice versa. Uh, it's a wonderful town. And after that, I'd like to do a uh, Chicago suburbs book for the number three in the series. But things are a little bit in flux right now. So we'll see where that goes. And uh, you talked a little bit about your tours. At the beginning, you said, oh, we, I could spend a whole hour here on my tour. So you do walking tours as well, or you have I have, yes. Past? Right now, I'm recovering from, as you know, from, from spinal surgery. <laughs> so I'm not walking very much right now. But hopefully, I'll be able to do that again in the hopefully future. Hopefully, in the future. That seems that, that I, I bet that's very interesting and super popular. So, all right, well... Awesome. 
the uh, the rest of the comments that I didn't read because I don't want you to get a big head. Every <laughs> we've uh, they, our, 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 our guests have really really enjoyed this presentation, and I certainly have. Thank you all. And Thank uh, you. we're very grateful for you taking the time, and we're especially grateful for your um, uh, for your tailoring of the project to us. That was that was remarkable. So thank you so much. And thanks to all of you. And we will be back in January with Under the Buffalo and lots and lots of programming in December. So Wonderful. good night, everyone. Take thank care. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.